from the Confessions of Karl Panzram. The underworld code is very simple. It is never squeal, don't be a stool pigeon, a rat or an informer. All crooks want everybody else to believe that they are square. Cops are the same. They all wish everybody else to think they act from principle. They are always telling everyone they meet all about how much principle they have. It's against their principle to do this or not to do that. The queer part of this is that they not only want others to believe this, but they even believe themselves. But the real truth of the matter is that they deceive themselves and mistake policy for principle. When crooks are square with anyone, it is because it is for their own interest to be so. It is good policy. When it ceases to be to their own interest to be square with one another, then it becomes time to change their tactics. And they are not slow in doing it either. It makes no difference to them who they snitch on, no matter if they have been loyal to each other through a whole lifetime as partners and friends, no matter if they send their friends to prison or to hell by way of the rope or chair. That cuts no ice. They are looking out for their own precious skins. If they can benefit themselves at the expense of someone else, regardless of what the others have to suffer for their treachery, they will sure break the law of the underworld and open up and sing grand opera. I have known cases where men have been loyal pals and friends, have gone through every crime on the calendar, murders, rapes, robberies, in jails and in freedom, in health and in sickness, riches and starvation and privations, years and years together and always loyal and square with each other, but when the time came for the test of the first law of nature, self-preservation, everything went overboard. They all squeal sometimes, big crooks and little crooks. They all squeal when it is to their interest to do it. The greatest crooks I ever knew or ever heard of, they all do it. I have met every kind of a crook there is. I have worked and lived both with and against them. Coppers the same. I know their tricks inside and out. I have associated with every sort, both in prison and on the street. They and their works and their thoughts are like an open book to me. I know them well to my sorrow. I have been mixed up in every kind of a crooked deal. There is, with every kind of a crook, there is. Con men and gang men. Prowlers and boosters. Stick-up artists. Can-opener artists and sometimes face artists. Peter men and box men. Paper hangers and crepe hangers, hustlers and rustlers, pimps and magimps, hookers from the big town and hookers from the sticks, big shots and pikers, dynamiters and sodomiters, fruiters and poofters, dingbats and gay cats, shiv men and gunmen, needle pumpers and snow snifters, hop heads and jug heads, wise guys and dumbbells, bootleggers and rum runners, wolves and gunzels, dips and short card gamblers, Home guards and boomers, booze fighters and cop fighters, and last but not least, muzzlers and guzzlers. I have put in 29 years in the game of hooks and crooks. There is no angle of this game that I haven't tried at some time or other. My kind have their names for each other. Booster, shoplifter, prowler, burglar, stick-upper heister, hold-up man, jughead, dumbhead, Hophead, dope fiend, a smoker of opium, snowbird, cocaine sniffer, needle pumper, hypodermic user, con man, confidence man, shiv man, knife man, can opener, outfit of tools to rip a safe, peter man, box man, or safe blower, sometimes used to describe a man who slips a peter or knockout drops in another's drink, a keely. A pimp is a pimp, and a magimp is both or worse than either. Paper hanger, forger, crepe hanger, either a gloom or killer. Catting up a scatter or gin mill to hold up a saloon. Mob is the same as a gang. A gunzel is a punk, and a punk is a poofter, and a poofter is a pratter, and a pratter is similar to a fruiter. The only difference between the two is that one likes to sit on it and the other likes to eat it. A uh, face artist is an exceptionally well-experienced fruiter, one who knows his bananas better than an amateur. <laughs> A face artist is one who goes downtown for lunch and nosedives into the bushes when he's hungry. You know what I'm saying? 
Croker, a prison doctor, and a very appropriate title it is, too. Big Finger, Warden, Second Finger, PK or Deputy, Screws, the Big Finger's Dogs, Dance Hall, Death House, Big House, Hoose Gal, Stir or College. To pull off a hot prowl is to turn off a trick in a private or a joint that is to be kipped or bugged. That is to rob a place where people are sleeping or that is wired. To get a stretch and stir, to do a bit in the Hoose Gal. To make a lamb, to crush out of the hoose gal. A big shot is a leading light of crookdom. A wolf is one who has a preference for a gunzel. Sometimes they fall madly in love with each other, and then the green-eyed monster stalks abroad. I have met thousands and thousands of my kind in every different degree, from the kingpins and the biggest of big shots down to the greasiest of grease balls, and without exception, one and all insist on deluding everybody else and themselves also that they are square, that they have in their makeup the sparks of principle and honor, that they keep the code of the underworld, that they never squeal. Anything and everything against anybody and everybody is quite all right and permissible at any time or place, but the one rule that must be kept by all, regardless of anything else, is that they must never squeal, no matter what happens, no matter what pressure is brought to bear on them to get them to open up and squeal. If the coppers work the old mother and Jesus racket on them or give them the third degree, a wrong rap with a big stretch and stir or even the rope or the chair, still they are supposed to keep their traps shut and never squeal. I have never met or heard of anyone yet who ever admitted that they were wrong and that they were stool pigeons, squealers, or rats. They all insist that they are right guys and square crooks, even when they are caught right in the act of going on the stand as a witness for the state against their pals. They won't admit it. One and all insist that they are men of honor and that they act from principle only. They all swear that they are loyal to the first law of the code of the underworld. In theory, this seems to be the case, that the average person really believes this to be true and that most crooks believe it also. The average superficial observer only sees a very small part. He sees nothing of what goes on behind the scenes and under the surface. The actual facts of the matter are that none of the crooks are square with one another or with anybody. They are not square with the coppers, and the coppers are not square with them. The coppers are a pretty dumb lot. Most of them are well supplied with big flat feet and a big fat head, which is usually sadly lacking in gray matter. The coppers I have known, and I have known plenty of them, too damn many in fact, were and are a bunch of dumbbells who couldn't track an elephant in a snowbank unless they first had some rat or stool pigeon to lead them to it and point it out. Most of them have plenty of brawn, but few have any brains. With all of the forces of the law behind the coppers, all the steel bars and stone walls, their guns and clubs, all would avail them nothing if it wasn't for their rats and stool pigeons. The third degree and the rats are the best and worst weapons that the cops have. Yet they will never admit that they have or use either. Perhaps it isn't generally known, but it is a fact nevertheless that during the World War every man in this country was classified all according to their mental and physical and moral conditions. The crooks and coppers were both put in the same class, which was pretty low down in the scale. Few people know that gangsters and gunmen in New York City have on several occasions made special reservations and very expensive trips to and from the Clinton prison, or that they have invited the warden and the second finger, second warden, and eight or nine screws at a time to come down to the big town where they were wined and dined at the Silver Slipper and other nightclubs, all at the expense of those gangsters and gunmen. All of these things are matters of common knowledge among the underworld. Many coppers know these things. The Silver Slipper and the Cotton Club are the special hangouts of both cops and crooks. Anyone at any time can verify these things. Therefore, it stands to reason that the coppers and the crooks are all working together and all double-crossing each other at the same time. And yet each and all of them are always yelping about their honor and their great principles. Honor among thieves is the bunk. Crime. 
This country is having a war right now, 1928, and very few people even realize the fact. War, in the final analysis, is merely murder and robbery and the expenditure of life and property. This country today is having a crime war. Many thousands of lives and billions of dollars worth of property are lost every year. Crime is increasing 10% each year. All society is up in arms to combat crime and criminals. They are using every possible method that the law can devise. The best thing they have been able to do so far is to build bigger and stronger jails and prisons and fill them full of criminals. Just as soon as a prison is filled to capacity, they start right in building more and more. And they are all full. But still, there are more criminals every day. There is no end to them under the present system. Even the most superficial investigator of this question of crime knows this to be a fact. All of your police, judges, lawyers, wardens, doctors, national crime commissions, and writers have combined to find out and remedy the cause and effect of crime. With all of the knowledge and power at their command, they have accomplished nothing except to make conditions worse instead of better. This is not a theory. This is a fact. Statistics prove it beyond any possibility of doubt. This being the case, then they and their system must be wrong. Those who make and enforce the laws are more guilty than those who commit the crimes against the law. The criminal does not profit by his crimes. It is the lawmakers and the law enforcers who do profit the most. They, in reality, are the real cause of the most crime. They know it, too. That's why there is so much crime in this country today. Those who roar loudest about putting down crime are the very ones who cause the most crime. I am 36 years old and have been a criminal all my life. I have 11 felony convictions against me. I have served 20 years of my life in jails, reform schools, and prisons. I know why I am a criminal. Others may have different theories as to my life, but I have no theory about it. I know the facts. If any man ever was a habitual criminal, I am one. In my lifetime, I have broken every law that was ever made by both man and God. If either had made any more, I should very cheerfully have broken them also. The mere fact that I have done these things is quite sufficient for the average person. Very few people even consider it worthwhile to wonder why I am what I am and do what I do. All that they think is necessary to do is to catch me, try me, convict me, and send me to prison for a few years, make life miserable for me while in prison, and then turn me loose again. That is the system that is in practice today in this country. The consequences are that anyone and everyone can see crime and lots of it. Those who are sincere in their desire to put down crime are to be pitied for all of their efforts, which accomplish so little in the desired direction. They are the ones who are deceived by their own ignorance and by the trickery and greed of others who profit the most by crime. Much depends upon the point of view of the persons who express themselves on the crime question. Those who roar the loudest and are therefore the most heard are the writers, judges, lawyers, and would-be experts. And would-be expert criminologists. All of these people make a nice, soft living out of crime. Therefore, they are directly interested in that subject. They don't produce a damn thing. All they do is to shoot off their mouths and push a fountain pen. And for doing this, they live nice and soft. They wear good clothes, eat the best foods, live in nice homes, have the best of everything the world produces. They have a nice, soft graft, and they know it, too. They are not a lot of chumps like the criminals. Don't think for a minute that they are going around really meaning to do as they say they wish to. Put down crime. Not a chance. There will be no pick and shovel for that sort of people. That's what would happen to them if they really did put down crime. There is two sides to every question. My point of view is just as plausible and a damn sight more probable than all of the hot air that has been published about this question. Others who have expressed their ideas in print on this subject have all been either directly or indirectly interested in receiving some sort of profit or benefit of some kind from what they say or write or do about this crime question. 
Some have good jobs, which they want to keep, or perhaps they're trying to get a better one, or perhaps they're merely incensed and prejudiced against criminals because they or their friends have been robbed or murdered. I, on the other hand, have not a single thing to gain by writing this. My life and my liberty are forfeited. I cannot gain a single thing in any way for writing this. I am not writing this because I expect some benefit by doing it. I am not trying to do myself or anyone else either harm or good. My only motive in writing this is to express myself and my beliefs, my point of view. Perhaps I am altogether wrong, but on the other hand, I may be right and you may be wrong. Let the facts speak for themselves and then judge the results. Under the present system, the best and the worst you can do is just as you are doing now, and that is making bad matters worse. Before you can ever put down crime, you must change the system a whole hell of a lot, and you must change your educational system. You must absolutely divorce the schools and prisons from all politics. As things are now, you are making criminals much faster than you are reforming those who are already in existence. Every child has some criminal tendencies. It is your place to correct those traits and teach them the right way to live while they are young and their minds are forming. Then when they do reach the age of reason and action, it will be quite natural for them to live clean, upright, honorable lives. In that way, you will stop crime at its source before it begins. As for the criminals that are now in existence and working at their trade or those that you now have in prison, you can reform those who are capable of being reformed. And those few who are incapable of any kind of reformation, you can keep them where you have them now, in prison where they can do no harm. These two things you can do or you can keep on doing as you are now. Either make things better or worse. If you think that you can stop crime by catching us, locking us up, punishing us by brutal treatment, hanging or electrocuting us, sterilizing or castrating us, then you are a fool for thinking that way. That only makes bad matters worse. A child is very easily led. Any child, if properly taught, will live the way he is taught to live. All criminals are merely overgrown children. It is in your hands to make us or break us. We, by our own efforts, are failures in life, simply because we don't know any better. We don't know how to live decent, upright lives. Heredity has very little to do with the shaping of our lives. The main causes of why we are what we are is because of our improper teaching. Lack of knowledge in our environments. Every man's philosophy is colored by his environments. If you don't want us to rob, rape, and murder you, then it is your place to see that the mental and moral misfits are properly taught a sufficient amount of useful and sensible knowledge and put into the proper environment where they can be best fitted to exist in life. Otherwise, they will be misfits and failures, and you are the actual cause because they don't know any better and you do. My own case is very similar to many thousands of others. I was born a normal human being. My parents were ignorant, and through their improper teachings and improper environment, I was gradually led into the wrong way of living. Little by little, from bad to worse, I was sent to a reform school at the age of 11 years. From that day to this, all my life has been lived among moral and mental misfits. All of my associates, all of my surroundings, the atmosphere of deceit, treachery, brutality, degeneracy, hypocrisy, and everything that is bad and nothing that is good. Is it unnatural that I should have absorbed these things and have become what I am today? A treacherous, degenerate, brutal, human savage, devoid of all decent feeling, absolutely without conscience, morals, pity, sympathy, principle, or any single good trait. Why am I what I am? I'll tell you why. I did not make myself what I am. Others had the making of me. If someone had a young tiger cub in a cage and then mistreated it until it got savage and bloodthirsty and then turned it loose to prey on the rest of the world to go anywhere and kill anyone it wanted to, then there would be a hell of a roar from those in danger of the mad tiger. Everyone would believe that to be the wrong thing to do. Everyone would believe that to be the wrong thing to do. But if some people do the same thing to other people, then the world is surprised, shocked, and offended because they get robbed, raped, and killed. Yet this is exactly what is being done every day in this country. 
they done it to me and then don't like it when I give them the same dose they gave me. They do it to thousands of others and the others in turn retaliate by robbery and murder. If you don't like to be robbed, raped, burned, or killed, then stop your own injustices, your own dirty work. Stop your lying and hypocrisy. Live decent yourselves and teach others who are not able to do right unless they are taught right. If you get abused, robbed, or killed, you have it coming to you. So don't blame it all on the one who harms you. Some of the blame is yours for not making it your business to see to it that such conditions should not exist among your fellow men. If you put a lot of powers in the hands of your public servants and they misuse their power, then you are at fault also. I have only a little knowledge, but I have as much intelligence as the average person, and I know that I was taught wrong. I could have been taught properly, and if I had been, I feel sure that I would have led a far different life than I have done. You are to blame more so than I. That's my belief. If you are going to go on teaching others as you have taught me, then you must suffer the same as I.